The Accursed Chair, Volume 2, The History of Eroticism, Part 1, Introduction, Eroticism and the Reflection of the Universe in the Mind. 1. The Primary Incompatibility of the World of Eroticism and the World of Thought. We never grasp the human individual, what he signifies, except in a delusive way. Humanity always contradicts itself. It goes suddenly from goodness to base cruelty, from extreme modesty to extreme immodesty, from the most attractive appearance to the most odious. We often speak of the world, of humanity, as if it had some unity. In reality, humanity forms worlds, seemingly related but actually alien to one another. Indeed, sometimes an immeasurable distance separates them. Thus, the criminal world is, in a sense, farther from a convent of Carmelites than one star is from another. But not only do these various worlds exclude and ignore one another, this incompatibility also concentrates in a single individual. When he is with his family, this man is a good-natured angel, but when evening comes, he wallows in debauchery. The most striking thing is that in each of the worlds to which I allude, ignorance, or at least disregard, of the others is the rule. Even the father playing with his daughter forgets, as it were, the disreputable places where he enters as an inveterate pig. He would be surprised in these circumstances to recall the filthy individual he has remained, breaking all the delicate rules he observes in the company of his daughter. In a comparable way, men who at home are only peaceful, obliging peasants, who bounce their children up and down on their knees, in wars are capable of burning, pillaging, killing, and torturing. The two worlds in which they behave so differently remain unconnected to one another. What gives partitions of this sort an intangible solidity is that that reflective, coherent thinking which alone has formed a rather durable image of man, the image that in theory presides over the construction of my book, itself forms, by itself, a determinate world. The admissible judgments concerning man, always having a coherent, reflective form, are those of the world of thought, which by definition has little or no contact with the disapproved worlds, and which even keeps aloof from certain acknowledgeable but disturbing worlds. I'm not saying that thought, constituted as such, is unacquainted with that which it calls inhuman, or foul, or shady. But it cannot really integrate it. It knows it from above, through condescension, from the outside. All that is strictly a subordinate object for it, which it considers arbitrarily, without recognizing its own involvement in the way that medicine regards the diseases. It will never incorporate this accursed domain into conceivable humanity, which alone is constitutive of thought. Yet one might believe that psychoanalysis considers the entire sexual domain without reservation. That is true, but only superficially so. Even psychoanalysis is obliged to define it scientifically as that element from the outside which is unassimilable, in theory, to clear consciousness. Doubtless, for psychoanalysis, the concrete totality without sex is inconceivable, but the thought that is proper to science is nonetheless regarded as actually inviolable, as if sexuality, which played a part in its formation, thereafter no longer modified it, or if so, only in a superficial way. For psychoanalysis, sexuality and thought stay on opposite planes. Like the others, psychoanalysis is a science that considers abstract facts, isolated from one another, occasionally influencing one another. In this way, it retains the moral privilege of abstract thought, always worthy of great respect. It accommodates the sexual element, but this is insofar as its developments reduce it to abstraction, from which the concrete fact remains manifestly distinct. But it is possible, beyond this correct procedure, to envisage another in which the arrogance of science or of thought could not be maintained, where eroticism and thought would no longer form separate worlds. 2. The world of eroticism and the world of thought are complementary to one another, and without their congruence the totality is not fully realized. 
I will hold to a starting principle as my book progresses. I will consider the sexual fact only in the framework of a concrete and integral totality, where the erotic and intellectual worlds are complementary to one another and are situated on the same plane. Of course, the place of sexual life is humanly delimited by a prohibition. Sexual life is never unreservedly free. It must always be confined within the bounds that custom sets. It would be useless, certainly, to oppose the prohibition by denouncing it. It is not human to say that only freedom accords with nature. In fact, man sets himself essentially apart from nature. He is even vehemently opposed to it, and the absence of prohibition would have only one meaning, that animality which men are conscious of having left behind, and to which we cannot aspire to return. But it is another matter to deny the abhorrence of nature, built into our essence, which sets our properties against animal simplicity, another matter to comply with the judgments that ordinarily accompany the prohibitions. In particular, thought is compelled by the morality implied in the prohibitions. Further, it let itself be formed in the world devoid of sensuality, which the prohibitions marked off. Thought is asexual. One will see this limitation, antithetical to sovereignty, to every sovereign attitude, make of the intellectual world the flat and subordinate world that we know, this world of useful and isolated things in which laborious activity is the rule, in which it is implied that each one of us should keep his place in a mechanical order. If I consider, rather, the totality which exceeds on all sides the reduced world of thought, I know that it is made up of distances and oppositions. But I can never, without turning away from it, let go of one of its parts for another. For the popular voice, it takes all kinds to make a world, prostitutes and saints, scoundrels and men whose generosity is boundless. But that voice is not of established thought, which reduces man to the neutral part and denies this integral ensemble, combining the giving of oneself and the tears with the massacres and the revelry. I don't intend in this way to declare a vague judgment concerning men, but rather to define a way of thinking whose movement corresponds to the concrete character of the totality that is offered for reflection. I would like to set forth this method by using it rather than by analysing it separately, but I needed to begin by saying that my purpose, to talk about eroticism, could no more be isolated from the reflection of the universe in the mind than the latter could be isolated from eroticism. But this implies in the first place that reflection, thought, under these conditions, must be commensurate with its object, and not that my object, eroticism, be commensurate with the traditional thought that established the contempt for that object.